Hey friends and neighbors, my name's Jude. Welcome back to the channel. We're in our command and control center of our church, the sound booth. I don't know if this has happened to you, but recently this happened to us. Silence has gone by until finally now he's come. And even though the idea in the Old Testament of this suffering Messiah who would shed his blood for the sins of his people, even though that was... So in today's Sound Advice, we're going to talk about this, the RF Venue Diversity Fin Antenna, and why this might be your solution to wireless problems. Before we can start talking about how the diversity fin antenna works, I need to show you how we are using wireless mics, and then also we need to have a basic understanding of how RF, or radio frequencies, propagate in a room. I also want to introduce you to Curtis Judd. He has a great YouTube channel where he does a lot of reviews on audio products. This was one of them. He recently did a review on the diversity fin antenna. The paddle or shark fin part of the antenna is oriented vertically, and the dipole is oriented horizontally. They're configured 90 degrees apart from each other to help prevent dropouts. Curtis talks about the pros and cons of the antenna, and he puts it through some real world tests. I'd encourage you to watch his video and get more information about how the diversity fin antenna works. Now let's go down to the stage and look at where our radio frequencies begin. If you know anything about me, you're going to know that I'm always going to prefer a corded or a wired mic over wireless. A corded or wired microphone is a closed loop system. The chance for interference is very little. But when we get to a wireless mic, it's more of an open loop system and the chance of interference goes up dramatically. Once the microphone captures the sound, the signal is digitized and then modulated into an RF signal. That RF signal is broadcast through this little monopole antenna at a strength of 10 milliwatts. 10 milliwatts, that's it. Once that modulated signal leaves the antenna, it's broadcasted or radiated at 360 degrees. Our room is tuned acoustically to be very lively on the front end and more dead in the house. Our back wall is very reflective. The ceiling is 90% reflective. The floor is reflective. We want the natural acoustic sound to project as far as it can. That means we don't have to amplify it as much. But with wireless, that can be a problem. Wireless frequencies are polarized, meaning the signal has to go all in a certain direction. And when you have a room that has multiple reflections, you can get multipath polarization. You can get phasing that happens with your wireless signal. On top of that, our preachers don't stand still. They're constantly moving. So that means that wireless signal that's transmitting from the body pack has to hit the receivers in order to complete the circuit. Once the modulated signal reaches the receiving antennas, the signal's then demodulated and put back into a signal that we can use. These monopole receiving antennas, they're omnidirectional as well, so they pick up 360 degrees. Up until about five years ago, that hasn't been a problem. But with T-Mobile buying the entire 600 megahertz frequency spectrum and all of the audio and TV channels that had to move, that has crowded the audio spectrum so much that these omnidirectional antennas are now the weakest part of our signal chain. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This is a scan of the radio frequency spectrum. We're going from 480 to 700 megahertz. We're using this little scanner this is a spectrum analyzer for radio frequencies. This is made by the same company, RF Venue. This is now a required piece of equipment with Pro Audio. Here's T-Mobile. This is T-Mobile's uplink and then T-Mobile's downlink. T-Mobile bought the entire 600 megahertz spectrum. Everybody that was in the 600 megahertz spectrum had to migrate down to 470 to 608. The FCC had a fancy name called repacking. So let's zoom in closer on this. This is the usable wireless frequency spectrum in the UHF, ultra high frequencies. It's 470 to 608. That's what a TV station looks like. TV has six megahertz to work with. So in the Oklahoma City market, from 470 to 608, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 TV stations. Plus, there's a few other transmissions as well, and I don't know what those are. So let's look at one of these. Here is 530 megahertz. 
This is Oklahoma City's KWTV Channel 9. They're a CBS affiliate, and they're broadcasting here at 530 megahertz. And this is what KWTV looks like in person. Put a little antenna on the back of that. That is your transmitter, essentially. What's coming out of there is exactly on the frequency that you're supposed to be on uh, with all the, the guide data and all that. It's all embedded. It's all ready to go. That's your TV signal. Everything else that comes through is just amplifying it over and over and over, just building that signal up until you have, have just a massive amount that gets sent up the tower to the antenna. Each one of these is a power amplifier, and it's got three smaller amplifiers on there. So the signal comes out, it's split between all this, runs to each. So it just takes those three, combines them. Takes all these, combines them. Takes each one of these cabinets and combines it. Outputs from each cabinet combines it. 748,000 watts is being emitted from the antenna versus the 64,000 watts that we're sending up to it. We use the uh, spectrum analyzers and system analyzers to make sure that we stay well within our allotted frequency area. And then our shoulders have to maintain a certain amount. So uh, with the transmitter, as you amplify it up, there can be some noise down below. And the goal is to try to make sure that we stay as clean as possible, keep those shoulders as narrow as possible. Because if these branch out, that's where you start getting into interference with other stations. That's just just kind of extra noise that that transmitters have. And then this right here is the the main signal, and then that's your carrier spike right there. Let's talk about the problem. This is the regular whip antenna that we use. It's a monopole, 360 degree pickup pattern. When our wireless mics broadcast from the stage, that RF modulation bounces around in the room and we start to get multi-path polarizations, which our antenna is only polarized in one direction, but when we have the multi-path polarizations or phasing, it starts to cause problems. Now most of our modern wireless mics have diversity antennas or two antennas that are picking up independently. That receiver is choosing the best or strongest signal, A or B. That's also another reason why we turn our antennas in a V-shaped formation so we can try to work with some of those multipath polarizations. So that's where this new diversity fin antenna is going to surpass the monopole. This is a log periodic dipole array with a dipole antenna. So the dipole array is just a series of antennas. Now typical dipole arrays have the first antenna in phase, the second antenna out of phase, third in phase, fourth out of phase. So the in phase and out of phase receiving antennas focus the beam pattern. Where this monopole is 360 degrees, 
this dipole array is now only 120 degrees. That means whichever way this is focusing, we're gonna reject from side to side, and we're gonna reject most of what's coming back behind it, and it's gonna focus all of its pickup pattern in front of it. With our multipath polarization, we have a dipole antenna as well in a perpendicular or 90 degree plane from the dipole array. So we have two different types of antennas picking up two different types of polarizations. 120 degrees may seem like a narrow pickup window, but when we're nearly 80 feet from the transmission of the signal, 120 degrees is a wider space than you'd realize. But this should help solve the biggest reason of our dropouts, which is from multipath polarization. This is a very tight focused medium gain antenna. Even though the diversity fin is a fairly new product on the market, the dipole antenna is not. It was first used in the late 1800s by Heinrich Hertz. We're talking over 130 years ago. And if you know your history, Hertz is what we call cycles per second. 60 cycles a second, we'd call that 60 Hertz. What I love about this product is it's a simple setup. We're using physics, this is free gain. We're using just a simple logarithmic approach in fine tuning the focus of this antenna. We're not using any fancy processing or any amplification. So in 2022, look for the simple solutions. Instead of over processing or over amplifying something, look for the simple physics that have been tried and true by men and women of old that have dedicated their life so we can have a better today. My name's Jude, thank you for watching. And this is my sound advice. So if you miss a battery, does HR call you up the next day like, hey, that, that strike one, you're going to channel four if that happens again. I mean, does, does that happen?